down further and maintenance on that would have been painful. I remember, weren't you right at the end doing all kinds of little spiffy this, oh. spiffy that? And... Mm -hmm. It wasn't spiffy. It was Jeff the domestic. It was septic Painting. tanks and radon oh. filters. Oh, and... oh, I don't yeah. remember that. I remember painting. cosmetic radon. Oh, I didn't remember that. Sure. It was septic. painful. Really? So that's, I mean, that inspection process and that, well, this is what it says in the closing agreement, but um. can get unpleasant. Hopefully with friends, it'll be better. Uh, We've been pretty open about it. And like we wrote the contract ourselves, private sale. Oh, well, so that's nice. That saves a whole bunch. 6%, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's like, you know what? I told them, hey, have an inspection guy come in anyway. I think the house is mm -hmm. fine. What the hell do I know? Inspection guy is going to come in and do the inspection. But then after that, we just sit down and go, what's fair? You know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're going to oh, set the price sick. essentially based on the appraisal. So That's really good. Unless the appraisal is really low, in which case. Oh, the appraisal part. I meant the inspection part. Yeah, ours, under, ours uh, appraised under what uh, <coughs> well, we paid for it. Not by a lot, but like 11000 and so we had to cover it. Don't underestimate the proximity to Dairy Queens and liquor stores. <laughs> I think that's of more value to the person buying the house than it is to the appraiser. <laughs> it's going to bump it up by probably 10%, 15%. So you guys want to do a show? Or? Sure, let's do. All right. Go for it, Johnny. Is anyone recording, by the way? How do we how do we record? Jeff's not even there anymore. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> he <laughs> should record and. He's a pretty vital part of the. All that stuff. Well, maybe we'll just wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll just hang on until he comes back. <sighs> this monitor is not nearly big enough. You didn't warn me about that, Dave. Once you get used to two monitors, the laptop just seems really small. I'm switching so you're trying back. Trying to move these things out of the way. I'm going to switch back. Switch back to what? A 12 inch monitor. No, you're not. Why would you do that? Focus. I find the two screens, the more, the longer oh. I have them, the less I can focus. Well, what about was, one screen that's a nice size? 12 inches? That's ridiculous. Well, I mean, most of the time I need to focus, I need to type. And when I'm typing, I mean, when I'm editing, it's one thing. I can fire up the beast and work on it. But when I'm typing, I don't need a lot of... Uh... I took out the iBook the other day, which still runs. Oscar uses it and started typing on it. I got more work done the half an hour I worked on that than I had in, like, two hours beforehand. Cause... So you're saying because you can't have a bunch of windows open, you mean? Is yeah, I, there's no space for anything to distract me. There's only oh. space. I have to use the whole space. No shiny things. No shiny Leap. things. Leap it's a problem. Interesting. I've disconnected my second monitor at work. Really? Mm. Yep. Pretty soon you'll be using paper and pen. Why it's did you disconnect crazy. your second monitor? I'm just I'm finding it hard to focus. I'm having a really hard time getting a lot of work done recently. I find uh, that I'm closing the browser helps. Is this you think a technical issue or a psychological <laughs> I issue? I think it's more mm -hmm. psychological. I think. I think it might be psychological. I think I'm just hitting a point where I'm having a harder time. Um... Mm hmm. Huh. Mm -hmm. So, we'll see. Kind of develop. I'm gonna get a Mac. I'm gonna get 11 inch. I'm gonna get an 11 inch MacBook Air. Is it useful to have, you know, two putty windows open in a browser and move back and forth? And I have I one of the things I've got open all the time is top on putty. On the yeah. top or the screen over there. On the what do you find yourself distracted by? The, the what kind of thoughts or activities? Uh, all kinds. Are we gonna start the show or we can? This is a perfectly Maybe valid we have. topic of discussion. Ed Tech like Weekly 206. December 11th, 12th, go. Yeah. Go. Dave, Dave. Distracted. you want names? Dave. Uh, uh, Jeff Lebo. John Schenker. Jennifer Madrill. Dave Cormier. Dave Cormier of the 11 inch screen. And What's the distracted on, Donald Trump of PEI. What's going on, yes. Dave? So I'm considering moving back to um, an 11 inch screen to do the majority of my work because um, the older I get, the less real work I do and the more sort of report writing and sort of notes and planning and project stuff that I'm doing. Uh, and I find that I'm having a harder time keeping track of, um, of the work that I'm doing and where I'm at. So I've got an article I'm trying to write right now um, on rhizomes again. And um, what the other thing I'm using is the, the open full screen button on, um, on uh, the Mac. 
which I'm also finding helpful, but I'm finding that between the servers and the Twitters and all the rest of that stuff, I'm finding myself more and more distracted recently. Didn't we do, uh, talk about that one, the ambient awareness or something like that? That's like mm -hmm. an actual concept, like mm -hmm. you studied. What changed? You know, the Was it the technology that changed or Dave's world nope. that changed? I think it's just me. I think I got to the point where um, enough of the things that were that were driving I, I think I used to write more because I felt like I should and like I felt like I needed to get a post out there so I could have reputation and all those things and I don't care about any of that anymore so that sort of nervous or whatever driver the ambition or whatever that part's gone um, might it have been that you did a week in change 11 and all of a sudden a higher percentage of the noise was talking about you and so you want to pay attention to that? <laughs> that could very well be. I could, there was an awful lot of the noise that was about me. I, and then last night I got uh, somebody asked me a dozen questions. Um, it was really weird to see a blog post entitled 12 Questions for Dave Cormier. And, uh, <laughs> I suppose I should answer those. <laughs> so what about though, like just basic usability? I mean, I got old eyes. My eyes are 45 years old and I, I, I don't think I could spend my day on a 11 inch laptop without that having gives, headaches. That gives me eight years. Yeah, you got a, you got a while. <laughs> you got a while, but it's... Uh, Use them while you got them. I think for me, yeah. well, that's that's the sweet spot. 11 to 13 is really good. You can do most of the stuff that you need to do uh, as long as you're doing them one at a time. I found yeah. that uh, I switched to a desktop at work from using the laptop all the time because I wanted two monitors and I have two mm -hmm. monitors now and it's really useful for me if I'm doing any kind of scripting, you know, if I want to have a couple terminal windows open or because I can't remember PHP from one day the to the next. So I have to look have all, everything yeah, the, the up. The instruction manual on one so side and the type browser of over on one side yeah. and terminal window on the other one, you know, that's really useful. Uh, what, what I see on the distraction side though is if I have email over there or I have Twitter over there yeah. and I'm trying to do work on this other monitor, that can be a distraction. Well, I don't know how things work in the Mac world, but we've got this box that's got this in it and you click on that and the thing goes away <laughs> and then every time <laughs> and somebody types gone. in a message you get a little notification oh you've got a new email you but should I'm, go check that or i'm, I'm or responsible Jennifer for monitoring the social media Skype at my or... university like, yeah so is that considered I'm, a 24 7 <laughs> job so you're saying you can't see it but it's still there on the 11 11 inch dave monitor. gets an alert every time somebody mentions pete pei on the internet or Actually, upi or Anne of green gables so if you all well, tweet that thing. stuff <laughs> you want to irritate me, just keep, keep writing UPEI and everything you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag UPEI. Oh. Yeah, that some of it like is a job just... for an intern. Yeah. It's not really. <laughs> There's a lot of really subtle like we do a lot of direct um, direct client response on face on Facebook and Twitter. So we'll write right back to students, we interact with them, we've got a sort of a fairly good relationship with but them. But that means that somebody has Facebook open all the time. Right, and you yeah. know the little red number comes up, right. and now there's something there, and that's yeah, that's, right. that's more interesting than finishing this blog post or writing this paper or whatever. And, and the other thing that I'm doing now, and the the other reason for it is that I spend probably forty percent of my week in meetings now, so a lot of that time I've got to actually keep track of um, sort of that stuff too. So having something in the meeting, and I'm. I'm now going to meetings and I'm the only person without a, without a laptop. Um, and it was just kind of funny considering my job because um, uh, I'm supposedly the technology innovator but uh, no laptop. Um, which actually I did on purpose at the beginning because I found it really intimidating a couple, even a couple years ago. People found it, um, felt the need to always comment about the fact that I had a piece of technology on the table when I was working. And when we were meeting or when I was talking to them or whatever, now everybody's got them. In the last two years, essentially the entire senior administration of my university has moved to having a piece of technology on the table when they meet. Well, maybe this is a good segue to what John and I were chit-chatting about in the Skype chat room is that this whole idea of 21st century skills and all that mm -hmm. stuff, which we've mm -hmm. talked about many, many times. And it seems like we kind of have a recurring theme here. We talk about a lot of technology and we get excited about it, but it sounds like Dave's returning to the Stone Age on some of this. And I wonder if 
some of this is life uh, life cycle issues where you know you try stuff out and then you realize you know what I think I had it better when I sat and looked people in the eye when we were in a meeting and mm -hmm. <laughs> I got the intonation from their their voice rather than you know reading a text chat or something like that like what well, sure. what do you think it's so funny because today uh, this article that I'm writing today uh, it starts out with every technology limits you they're they're, in, they're inherently limiting so the the comparison I'm using is the train Train's really great, but it only goes along the commercial main lines, right? And it stops at places that had enough money 100 years ago to get a train track to them, right? And there's a whole bunch of other stuff you get trapped into, so you can you just follow the rails. And I find any of these technologies do that to you. They take you one step away from being a human being to all of the subtleties that you have. And I find, if, if given the choice, I'll always meet someone face-to-face. -face. Given the choice, I'll always sort of try to see their face or any of those things. And I didn't used to think that. But. Yeah, but face-to-face -face limits you. If, if you know, face-to-face -face requires you be in the same proximal space, I would not be having this conversation. If, you know, face -to -face. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shocking. And without a train, it's hard to move around. I'm not saying the trains are bad or the technology is bad. It's just given the choice. This technology gives us something that we couldn't do this face-to-face. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. But it's even still, if we lived in the same city, it's still synchronous, and uh, you know, video, I guess, allows us to see Dave and Jeff and Jen, and you know, you, we can see your faces. Although, you know, audio by itself, I think, has has its merits as well. This is very different from, say, going to an asynchronous discussion forum because we're interacting in real time in real space. Um, I tried with my tech team this year to switch from having face-to-face -face meetings because we couldn't get, there are only 12 people on the team. We couldn't get them all in the same room at the same time. Over the last four years, we've never had a meeting where everybody was there. And so I said, well, let's just do this online. We, we set up, you know, Google group and have these discussions because we really need to talk about a whole lot of big issues um, regarding technology planning and where we're going as a school district and where we're going educationally. And I said, you know, I, I can't afford to do this in 45 minutes once a month. I need like an hour and a half every week, and we know we're not going to do that, so let's do this online. They didn't go for it. You know, they, there was very little participation, very little buy-in. They said, we need to sit around a table and, and knock this stuff out. So that's what we started doing. You know, sometimes it comes down to just the, having those personal skills and not everybody's a writer and not everybody is articulate enough to be on a video chat and be recorded and, you know, want to have that out there for the whole world to see. So there's a lot of advantages to just sitting around a table and knocking stuff out. And uh, Gary's asking in the chat room if anyone uh, on this call uses Second Life. And I can't say I ever used it to begin with. I had a log on at one point, but I can't <laughs> say I've been in it. Gosh, it's years now, so I, I don't. Does anyone else go in? No. I've been we in a few the, times we... in recent months, uh, mostly connecting with the language learning community. And, you know, they made some progress, but the same barriers of entry that were there five years ago are still there. There's a even, um, oh, the Linden Labs guy was posting something about, he's got a new project <laughs> now. And uh, he was... Uh, speaking about it in the past tense. So I think I think it's on its way out. I think open I, I think virtual worlds will, you know, continue to do something. Uh, but I think we'll, uh, Second Life is going to be in the past pretty soon. Although, you know, I still get a lot of people inviting me to do things in Second Life. So, you know, if I yeah, join a... Well, like our um, um, AECT has a Second Life group and they're always having a something or another and that I ignore. But. Which raises, to get back to Dave's earlier point and, you know, oh, so much, you know, got to check email and there's a post every two minutes or whatever. Notifications, people. You know, I mean, to keep your sanity, don't have email alerts that every time you get an email, you get an alert. If you don't mm -hmm. want the Second Life stuff, go into Second Life and turn off your group notifications. Mm -hmm. um, We're getting a new email address. That's I, what I did. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it sounds kind of small and silly, but same thing with Facebook. It, it is kind of that constant knocking on the door that drives you nuts, um, and I do feel like we have the option to control that. All right, well, let's circle back to what we used to talk about. Let's talk about it in terms of like learning, and we talked a lot about at one point back channels and how great they were, and then how bad they were. <laughs> so this is exactly the argument 
the foes of the back channel say. There's just too much going on, and the people aren't focusing on what they should be focusing on, or they can't focus on two things at once, rather than making a value judgment on what they should be focusing and on. And I feel like we just need to develop some new focusing literacies. You know, that if you don't want to focus on the back channel, if the back channel is distracting, don't. And if you think the speaker's boring and the back channel's more interesting, focus on that. I mean, I, I feel like it's a literacy, not that we older people have to teach the younger people, but we all have to learn. Um, and in ways, I think the, non, the, the non-digital immigrants, the digital natives sort of have, I, I don't think they focus better. I think they handle, they juggle better. Well, I mean, think right. about it. It'd be the way that I'm living my life now. Essentially, it'd be the equivalent of having an office in the middle of the mall, and, and like taking my desk and my chair and sitting in the middle of the mall and taking out a pencil, and working, and expecting to get any work done. You know, essentially, what I need to do is create a certain amount of use those 21st century literacies, the same way that you know you would build an office with the door on it and close the door and do the equivalent. Um, and I just, I haven't done, to be honest, I hadn't noticed how much time I was losing. And I threw rescue time on my computer and started tracking a little bit and went, wow, I could probably do better than that. <laughs> um, quick, old, old school here, new resource, new program, rescue time. What's that? <laughs> Tell us about rescue time. Link up, cool. please. That sounds great. Uh, rescue time is, uh, we'll track everything you do. Um, what? How long you had? What open? Whether or not you had a good time? How much time does it take to use? <laughs> you just turn it on, and then you forget about it. And then a week later, it sends you an email and goes, "This is what you did." And you went, "What are you?" Ag-? Oh, and uh, that's right. I was doing that. And then you take a look at it and go, "Wow, did I really spend, you know, ten hours last week with Gmail open? <laughs> you know, I gotta mm-hmm. do better than that." <laughs> So um, I, um, I've been interviewing for JOBs, and on one of the um, oh universities, no. I know, um, in one of the universities I was looking at, I pulled up their syllabi, and in, I think almost every one, it required students to, and these are college lo- level undergraduates and graduate students, a uh, requirement was turn off cell phones and laptops. And so I think, <laughs> kind of tying this into what we're talking about here, um, it sounds like we maybe could make the argument. I read it going, ah, yeah, I couldn't imagine sitting in a classroom without a laptop open. Um, but, you know, maybe Sometimes you do need to time focus. and place. And, I don't know. And just on that other point there, and I know you don't want to to dwell on the unpleasantness ahead, Jen, but if, if somebody actually Googles you and finds this, hire her for crying <laughs> out loud. I mean... Seriously, she's she's crazy smart. And oh, cool! I can have <laughs> Dave. Except for Dave's picture. Dave's I'll saying that Dave's saying not to, but you know, hopefully they won't have the video. They'll just hear the audio and. See, I feel like rather than her doing the interviews, her potential employer should interview with us. We need to oh. accept them. Oh, that would. You know, be we're good. not going to let her go to just any <laughs> employer. That is really a good idea. <laughs> That's, that, we'll see how that goes. It's a two-way street. <laughs> I'm sorry I sidetracked your, your comment there. No, no, but I think it ties in. in. Yeah. It's, it's our whole, uh, you know, where, where, where do we stand as an EdTech Weekly group on technology um, conversation? And um, I, I know there would have been a day we would have all been appalled at that thought, but based on what Dave's saying, it's like students are sitting in the middle of the mall trying to learn, and is that most conducive to their learning? It, it, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? And it depends on what kind of outputs you're looking for. So... If what you're trying to do is establish a baseline of understanding in something, then you need to actually be engaged in what that is. And you can design technology so that if I had somebody, if I had a boss who spent, you know, who was in my office with me, sorting, organizing things so that my work got focused through that, I'd be fine. You know, if you bring that to a learning environment where you have somebody structuring, there's no problem. The problem is, is that I I report to a director who is really great, but doesn't really monitor or watch what I do in any way. We have no real reporting structure for the work I do, and I'm expected to innovate, and that's a nebulous kind of process. Um, so that there's none of that structure there. Now my the people who work for me are fine because they see me three, four, five times a day, and I do a fair amount of structuring of their stuff. Um, so while they have Twitter and Facebook and that stuff open, 
they don't struggle with it because they get almost daily targets from me that help structure that work. So I think that more resembles the learning environment than my scenario, which is probably more like the way John works, where there's nobody who really knows what I'm doing. From minute to minute, sure. Or from hour day, to hour. From week well, what to about week? your first part that said just being able to focus when you're writing, though? Do maybe is it get boiled down to time and place? You know, there's if, a time and place for everything. If I have everything. a, if I have a deadline spent. that's tomorrow, I have no problem focusing. Like if I have, a, if I'm going to go and I get a project that's due and I got to go do a presentation and stuff, the work gets done. My problem is, is we've got 300 things we need to write over the next 14 months. Yeah, that stuff is the stuff that kills me, and I don't think that would be a whole lot different before. It's the same reason why. This is the time of year when all the college dorm rooms are the cleanest. Mm-hmm. You know, always get their laundry done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. It's not that the technology is not actually different. It's that I don't have the literacies in place to go. Okay, what I should do is this now. I need to, and what I'm saying is, what I need to do is get an 11 inch laptop, get away from this comfy seat here, go sit somewhere or in, in my office or go to the library or whatever I need to do to get away from the knocks on the door and the Twitters and the rest of it and actually sit and get the work done. And that's why I'm looking at going back towards a small little laptop. And I want a really little laptop because I want it to be I want it to be so portable that it's just something I'll always slip in my bag. Mm-hmm. So John, when you were at your, size. when you were at, oh, oh, that's the size. I thought the size was small so you couldn't see the little green light flashing. No, 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 no. It's that um, I have a, I want it to fit in my purse. Oh, I gotcha. Your man purse. So, um, John, how does this tie in with what you were, uh, your conference, first of all, I want you to give a little background on what your conference was, and then how does this tie into how they were defining? Conference, yes. Uh, I went to a conference this week. It was the 21st Century Skills Summit. That Who let you in, go to a conference? Uh, actually, what happened was I told my, my superintendent wanted to go to one of those Apple-sponsored, everyone needs to have an iPad conferences or, or events and I said no don't go to that go to this one instead and then send them the information because Carl Fish was there and you and Macintosh was there they were Skype oh, wow. and pink and doing all this really good stuff Christian Long was involved oh. uh, I said go to this instead and he said okay and then I had to go with him so that's how I ended up ended up going my my superintendent is um, he, he kind of sees the writing on the wall regarding where we need to be heading in education but is pretty unsure you know how to get there, and um, he struggles with technology He's not himself. alone. <laughs> yeah, well, no kidding, right? So we're at this conference, which um, doesn't have free Wi-Fi, incidentally. It has about 600 people in it, and it, I, I had kind of suspected that because the conference center where they have it just charges crazy fees to the to people um, for Wi-Fi. So, so there was no Wi-Fi there. So you're, you're kind of using your phone, right? Cause I couldn't use the iPad cause it's wi- Wi-Fi only. And so I'm using my phone and, and doing some stuff on Twitter. And he said, well, what, and I showed him, I said, well, here we have a conference hashtag and we can follow back channel here. And people are tweeting about the speaker as the speaker is speaking. And so we started watching it for a while and he said, well, why would you want to do that? Why don't you just listen to him? And I said, well, yeah, you can listen to it, but you can also share and discuss and ask questions. And he he said, oh, okay. And he he sort of bought into that a little bit. And then I started watching the Twitter stream. And it's all, you know, everybody takes the soundbite and tweets it and retweets it and retweets it and retweets it and retweets it. And And 20 minutes later, they're still on the same soundbite. And, you know, there really aren't a lot of people asking questions or challenging the speaker or taking the, the conversation in a different direction. Speakers um, tend to ignore me when I send them questions via Twitter. <laughs> well, sure. Especially if they're, not, Especially yeah, if they're in the middle of a presentation. No, right. I tweet people in the audience and get them to try to ask the speaker. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you mean Raise when you're not at the conference? The, and the, say, yeah. Can you ask? Uh, can I, you, gotcha. I, I watch the things it, come down and then I go, can you ask them this question? Because I don't think that's going to work. And then I started thinking, you know, when I'm not at the conference, I don't pay t- any attention at all. Right. If if I am not at Educon and people are at Educon and, and they're I just turn off Twitter for three days because I know that everything that they tweet is going to be about some very specific thing that's happening at this conference that I'm not involved with. So, I filtered the hashtag this year. Exactly. Because again, it's it's the distraction. You're trying to do something else. And meanwhile, everybody else is having this conversation about something that, that you're not involved with. So I am kind of sort of wondering what 
you know, what the value is in the back channel. It, it could certainly have a place, but I don't see us using it that way. Well, I, you know, we've talked a lot about, too, um, how do you manage it as the speaker? If you are aware that there's probably going to be a back channel, if you're with a crowd that probably has a Twitter account, um, which is getting, I'm sure, more and more these days, encourage it. Do you have a screen in the background with the tweets going by and have someone yelling some out to you occasionally as we sometimes do on this when we see like I asked about or mentioned Gary's question before. Um, so it kind of gets into I guess the skills part of it. It's not so much the technology. Yeah, right. Twitter's there as a tool but if you're really not using it uh, in an effective it, manner, what, what's the point? It's very different for us, right? Because we all have screens in front of us. We're sitting in front of computers talking to each other. It's not like we have an audience of 500 people in front of us. You know, if if uh, if Carl Fish was on stage in front of these 600 superintendents and state school board members and, and you know, all of these uh, important people and me, um, and he were looking at his laptop screen all the time to see what the internet was saying about his presentation as he was giving it, it would not have been a very effective presentation. I find, I find though, for me as a speaker, um, yeah. like when I finished the, um, earlier this year, I was maybe 250, the crowd, um, mm -hmm. I found going back and looking at the Twitter stream really, really useful. Afterwards. So that's true too. And if I you, picked up you, a lot you... of conversations, sought people out, found them, and went, "Oh, is this you? I'd like to address the thing that you said." Um, and I found that to be re as a speaker, I find it amazing. I, I one just to find out what kinds of things are tweaking, like what kinds of what's hitting, what isn't. You know, mm -hmm. did I say something that really jarred people? And in in my case, is as much that as uh, the. The, the liking stuff, but that's you know, well, you know, that's what and, you get or, or it confused them, or they took something the wrong way, or they misinterpreted that's right. that's some right. slide I, that you had. So as or, the speaker, I think it's fantastic. I don't, I, I can't, I can't keep the rhythm of a presentation and follow a Twitter stream. I've tried, and it doesn't. I right. agree. I, I, I find it breaks because it's to me speaking is a storytelling activity, and while I can do the live slides and have the whole presentation be about the feedback, I can't have my own narrative and deal with the feedback. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is just about presentation mechanics and, and skills. You know, if, if you want to connect with a Twitter stream, you have someone assigned to keep an eye on forwarding questions. Um, and I don't feel like anything that different is really happening because of the technology. Yeah, you know, if I'm listening to an engaging speaker, I'm not going to be tweeting. You know, I'm going to be paying yeah. attention. Yeah. Some, but, you know, it, it, some people in that audience, same audience, maybe they don't think he's interesting or maybe they're airheads. What they're basically <laughs> doing, either they're, they're tweeting they're whatever, or if they weren't tweeting, they'd have like a little thought bubble saying, oh, I need to do laundry when I get home. <laughs> you know? <Right. laughs> right. Where am I going for lunch? Yeah, yeah that whole thing. Wow. Uh, well, Jeez. you know what? I was thinking, John, when you said it is sort of a, a tweeting is a skill, I guess, because if you're just sitting there repeating verbatim what the speaker just said, they'd be like standing up in the middle of the room and just repeating back like a parrot what the speaker is saying. Right. But now you're doing so well, really. I'm reporting, this, so if somebody's paying attention, yeah. But yeah, but if they're that interested, they'll pull up the person, the speaker's blog, and probably read where they've already said that someplace else. Well, so I, it's more interesting to have a skill that you know encourage the skill of, as uh, Dave said, uh, critique what the speaker's saying, or reflect upon it, or say, "Oh, this sounds like," or something like that. Because I mean, it on. and it depends on the format too. Because if you look at Illuminate or whatever, um, there the back channel is not really a; it's more like a front channel. Mm -hmm. Right, like it's not right. hidden, it's not right. a way, it's actually embedded in the process. And I don't know if you guys have ever been in one of my, well, you, you probably have at some point, but I find them extraordinarily useful and I use them all the time, right? When I speak in, because I find it, it's just, it's the way people are talking back and it's a chance to, instead of having to raise your hand and wait and to see if there's time or whatever. You're, you're also the, the very used to speaking for an hour at a time and watching a chat at the same time because you've been doing yeah, it for you know six years. So you can read about one subject and talk about a different subject at the same time and there's a very small minority of people who can do that. Airhead. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of space but, in there. Huh? But that's, I mean, we started this talking about 21st century literacies, right? And I think that this is one of them. I think that's one of them. I think that's one of those things that um, Processing multiple um, streams. Well, knowing what to attend to. Yeah, that's right. And and, and whatnot. Well, filtering, yeah. right? 
right? Yeah, and how to yeah how to chop up the because I don't believe in multitasking per at least I've never done it. Um, but I can cut the things that I'm doing into really small pieces. It's almost like um, like circular circular breathing, where yeah. you sort of save yeah, up yeah, some yeah. air in your mouth to push out while you're breathing in. So I've finished a thought. I can keep saying it, and while I'm finishing the thought, I can pull the next right. idea in. Right. Dave's brain does caching. <laughs> it's kind. Of, it is kind of like that. I mean, that's that's. I've I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and that seems to be the way that it works for me. I don't know how I can't speak for anyone else, but that seems to be the way it works for me. So, John, what are the other things that were like besides what you experienced as a uh, attendee? What types of topics were they saying are important skills that what, youngsters well, need to to build? It, it, this was this is part of partnership for 21st century skills so they're into the whole rainbow diagram that we've all seen a thousand times and don't understand we basically are not being boils distracted down by to you, dave we are focused on john see, part of the literacy had, is ignoring dave i had minimized the window don't, so i didn't exactly see don't it. attend to the crazy so man i'm putting my notepad window right over him, <laughs> so i can't even see him and, you know collaboration creativity communications critical thinking so so all the same kind of stuff <laughs> oh, so i was gonna say how is that a 21st I mean, we've done the, this topic yeah, certainly yeah, yeah, to yeah, death sure. but yeah okay That's so right. th those are pretty yeah. much important working, working together um, the 21st century would, literacy. right <laughs> you and mcintosh uh is doing a lot of work he he came out and his his thing lately is is that um we focus too much on problem solving and not enough on problem identifying and finding ah, the problems that are relevant to be solved and that we, we too often give our students um, a contrived problem and then have mm -hmm. them go out and mm -hmm. find a solution or we identify what is most way. important mm -hmm. or what is That's, most critical when we should be a lot more open-ended with them yep. and That's describe a, a situation my, to them, they identify the problem and then they go find a solution for it. That's my biggest critique of constructivism is that so often constructivism ends up being structured that way where I give you this problem and yeah you're doing problem stuff but in in life the problem is figuring out where where to start and that's why people get so frustrated with the MOOCs. Sure. That's a really don't... that's a, that's a nice way to phrase it. That's useful. It really I'm going to try and remember that. I'm going to tweet Which it to is myself. that? What what's that? <laughs> what did he say? What did he say? Say it's it not about that solving shift. problems, it's about identifying the problem. Oh yeah. Mhm. Mm right right. Sure. Or we spend too much time. Uh, Dan Dan Pink of course is talking about motivation and um, in Ohio, as in other places with Race to the Top, where there's a lot of uh, emphasis now on merit pay for teachers. And, you know, if we if we reward good teachers and we punish bad teachers, we're going to get better education. Um, and Pink's argument was teachers are the most motivated group of people he's ever seen in his life. He, he's worked a lot with businesses. He's worked a lot in a lot of different sectors. And he says, you know, when you have an employee who is working 10, 12 hours a day, goes goes to school all day and then goes home and does grading and, and is looking for resources and goes out and buys their own school supplies to bring into their classroom. And he, he said teachers are, are incredibly motivated already. Intrinsically and motivated. So motivation is not the problem. And working based on, on his uh, drive book, which is his current book, if motivation were the problem, merit pay wouldn't be the solution because uh, – Using merit pay and using financial incentives mm -hmm. are ways to help uh, people who are doing very menial tasks or very repetitive tasks to do those tasks more quickly or more accurately, but they do not help when there is problem solving, decision making, innovative thinking, those sorts of skills required to do the job. What the people really need is more control over their environment and more, if you want to increase their motivation, uh, give them a stay in what's going on. Um, but that that was helpful to hear, especially in a state where we're pushing merit pay for teachers and basing trying to base teacher uh, part of teacher salary on student performance and measuring that student performance uh, by using standardized tests. So it it was not something that was surprising to anybody who's read his books um, or or to most of the people in the room. But it was helpful to have that said in that forum where you have the state superintendent for public instruction and four of the state board members in the audience. So that was very helpful. Well, and the big problem with all of that is that as far as I can tell, and I mean, I'm just getting into the school system from a parent side now, um, everything pretty much happens before they go to school anyway. Like Oscar is already a year and a half ahead math wise, because mm -hmm. we just kind of talk about it. 
So mm-hmm. he's going to perform well in school with math because he already I mean, how much do they actually learn in the school and how much of it is just a product of the way that they live the rest of their lives? See, I think I think you're hitting on it right there. I think the, the real challenge for us, and again, I live in Chicago, so we have a lot of a lot of issues. <laughs> but there are a lot, a lot of poor kids that are out there that don't have a, a Dave and Bonnie to make sure they're coming to school with good <laughs> good backgrounds and things. and Or, or breakfast. Or breakfast. Or you know, clean clothes. Or a shower. Simple things. Or simple sure, sure. things like that. And so I think that's our challenge is like targeting to the individual what they need when you're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of kids in your school district. I I don't know and, what I mean. And we can totally do that, but we can't do that and teach collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and communication. We can do that and teach them how to take the test. And we can give them software that assesses where they are in math and says, this kid can't identify the numbers, you know, one through ten, and this kid is ready to do, you know, two digit division and they're both the same age, and we Ooh, can division. target that that instruction at the same, you know just do it online, grab the Khan Academy video, have them do some practice and, and whatever. We can do that electronically. That's easy. The problem is once you get beyond the how do I do this kind of problem and identify my own kind of problem and find a solution to it, that's where it gets hard. Can I can I ask, and I know we're way off topic here, can I ask a question that occurred we have to a topic? Today? Are we a topic? Kind of. <laughs> Are schools too hard? What do you mean too hard? Did you guys see the the the, ar- the article went up last week about what is Jeff doing in his house? <laughs> that's, that's the strobe light. I don't know. Oh. What was that? I don't know. The article last week that the school trustee in Florida who tried to take grade 12, the grade 10 standardized yeah, yeah. tests and failed them all, got 12% on the math standardized test. And, and he goes, I ha- I'm, I'm in charge of $3 billion in funding, but I can't do the grade 10 math. What's wrong here? And then, what's, wrong, what's wrong here is grade 10 math is irrelevant. This is my point. So is it possible that what we're trying to do is just teach too many things? Is school too hard? I, it's not too many. I think maybe the wrong things or the inappropriate right. things. Or the useless things. We're teaching the things that, that we've always taught. We, we're just adding on to the list, right? You know how many times I use uh, my, mul- my memorized multiplication tables? I, I use them all the time. Calculus, not so much. You know, exactly. I've had very few occurrences of using calculus. And you know what? The one time I did, I forgot all of it and had to relearn it. <laughs> yeah, but don't you think there's something to learning something that, that complex? And you, you build skills in learning how to tackle learning calculus. I don't I think there is, but I think it could be reshaped in challenging, relevant ways. I mean, how many people are scarred by calculus and never ever go back? Or or college. Well, then I think that gets back more to to John's point is um, rather than just we're going to teach this lesson and if you don't know it by the time the bell rings, then too bad because tomorrow we're on to the next topic. I think that's more of a critique of um, how how they were taught (laughs) and what our model is in most classrooms where everybody's going to move along whether you're ready or not. Here we go. Um, but calculus, or well, like advanced, cal- like what? Even, even algebra two, Dave. When was the last yeah. time you used the quadratic formula? I mean, yeah, you perhaps. Actually, did. I can I can tell you when the last time it was, when I was on the Khan Academy website when I was trying to do the math stuff. Well, if you because um... you were because you were trying to teach your preschooler how to do quadratic <laughs> equations. No, my GRE preschooler can only do. You would. That's he can sure. do multiplication. And you can do addition and subtraction, but no... Um... I don't know. I mean, I do think there may be virtue in developing our brains or in certain ways. I, I, but I do think the bigger question is, so, you know, failing the 10th grade math exam is, it, there's so much irrelevant stuff being taught and there's so much opportunity there's so much literacy that needs to be addressed and so many skills that could be addressed that are not well okay let's let's look at this from a practical standpoint i mean are we assuming then a 10th grader is going to know what their future is and i think you just even the most driven and i want to be an engineer 10th grader that he can you know you you can go ahead and skip you know pre-calc or whatever they probably will (laughs) so i don't know if we want it here's the deal if you take calculus in high school and unlearn, let's say you take, unlearn. let's say you take the AP test and you pass the AP test, you get a four on the AP test. That'll get you out of the first calculus test, 
the first calculus class in college. If you're not a math major, that means you don't have to take math in college. That's where it's useful. If you're going to be an engineer, you're going to take that first calculus course again anyway. Because and the truth and the truth is, is the way that it's build that foundation. The, the way that it's taught in high school is so different than it's often taught in university that you have to unlearn it and relearn it anyway. Yeah. Because then all of a sudden, what you need to do is make sure that a hundred thousand people know how to teach calculus in such a way sure. that it applies to multiple situations. Okay. So really, same, what you're saying is physics. the time and place again. So you're saying time and place in high schools. It's not the time or place, but it should be at a more advanced uh, stage in your education. Is that well, what you're and saying? If you, if you look at and if you look at physics, physics in high school is crazy com complicated because they can't assume that the students already have calculus. Whereas and if you take it in college, after they have calculus, physics is easy because you can use the calculus to teach the physics. Imagine the difference in our society if we took out all the high-level math in high school and replaced every single one of them with budgeting classes. It, to actually understand the broad management of funds. What mortgages are, how they work, how they come together, all that stuff. And see, Imagine I, I wouldn't advocate totally, total elimination of advanced math and total no math. integration of budget. I would say <laughs> no include math. them both and Use show how, One, show two, how three, they're four, connected. Five. You know, show that some of this advanced math can be used for budgeting. Uh, if you want to do a, an analysis of diminishing marginal returns, teach them economic principles. I think they, I think they do some of that now. But I just... I don't want math. That's bad. <laughs> That's why you. How you feel math. about how you feel about English, Dave? Do we need to learn literature. Learn it's literature. I don't know what that means. Well, like, Do you have to like uh, take a literature class? Do you have to have read? <laughs> to read like um, old books. I'm gonna get some I think, I think one. A little, a little dairy dog would be good for everybody. I mean, let's face it. More um, philosophy in high school. That's what I say. <laughs> that would actually be useful. Yes. I don't know. Well, this or, is so far or removed even from psychology my... would be really useful, wouldn't it? If you had an intro psych class and for every student in high school, just to learn how people work and how to get along with them and how to figure them out to on an, on some really basic level and what makes them tick and how to how to work with different personalities. Okay. Well, let let me take this. I wasn't going to go there because this could get ugly, and we might get our first hate mail if I if I go too far in this. But nobody so, listens to us. Uh, nobody math. listens anyway. So. I hate <laughs> math. <laughs> but our our recent Time Out magazine, which is kind of our, you know, cultural happenings in Chicago, happened to have a profile of a bunch of the Occupy Chicago folks. And I don't know if it's coincidental or if it was on purpose, but those that they highlighted were theater majors, art history majors. And these folks were bitching about <laughs> not being able to find a job. And I think it kind of ties into what you're saying um, sort of here that did their education prepare them for the world? And should someone maybe have said to them when they were filling out their, <laughs> their college application, you know, this is cool. If you want to be a, an art history major, that's great. But you may have trouble um, come graduation time finding a job. And so... You know, how do you? What are your thoughts on that? And I'm not saying everyone who's at Occupy Wall Street's a theater major, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a theater major, but I think it's just a little tough to read all these You're profiles saying that of people these saying, are the people who are "I don't know what job so you thought you were going to get." Occupy Chicago. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it gets to the point of like a lot of if kind of what we're saying here. You take physics and calculus when you're in college because you're prepping for a job. So if we view college as a place what to job? prep for the job. What job do you use calculus for? In college, if you're a physics major and you're a, or whatever. But you are? I mean, how many physics, physics majors engineering? Have jobs? Sure, right. I'm sorry. Say what? How many physics majors have jobs? I'm sure a lot have jobs. Doing what? Physics? Well, they're not. Maybe, <laughs> I don't think you'd go, go to like Indeed.com and like I want to be a physics guy. I mean. Those are skills that would be employable. Engineers use calculus. Something. Engineers and mm -hmm. yeah. So you just want the elimination of math from the universe, Dave? You're anti -math. But no, I mean, like, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of raising like an important question here, as uh -oh. far as like. Jen would like us to pay attention to our question. I'll well, say it, I think it ties in. It ties into what you're saying, sort of, is that the subject matter we teach should be related to something the person is going to do in their real lives. No, that that is not what I'm saying at all. Um, well, I think it did because you just kept saying you never use calculus again, and so no, no I, I was being it? I was I was being funny about math. Um, no, <laughs> I, I took 
you know, seven calculus courses. Um, the the simple fact is the stuff I learned in high school didn't bridge at all, which is the problem that I have. Not that people study calculus, that there's no way to bridge between those two school systems. They don't make sense with each other. So there's no sense trying to integrate them, which is my critique there. In terms of theater majors and studying for jobs, uh, we have a, you know, we have a course right now um, that's starting out, I think in January, called um, the business of art, business of the arts, essentially, um, which they're trying to integrate into the arts program to do Tao business. You know, if you're going to run a, if you want to be a theater major and you want to do theater, then you should probably understand how the theater business works because it's a big part of, you know, trying to do that. Um, I'm not suggesting that our university should somehow become vocational. Um, definitely not. I think that, that there's a neoliberal sort of wow. takeover of the whole system that I'm not interested in. See, I, I think, though, that's a huge converted. disservice to these people who are spending 25, 35, 45, whatever thousand a year <laughs> thinking they're going to walk out and be able to do something, mm -hmm. but they're not prepared to do anything. Right. I mean, my philosophy degree did not prepare me for the work I do now, but I'm glad they let me take it. Um, right. And that it wasn't vocational because it allowed me to stretch my brain in ways that become really useful for the work that I do. Um, you didn't go to your undergrad to be an insurance person. Um, well, actually, but I was an insurance major, actually. You were an insurance major? <laughs> yeah, risk management and insurance That's with hilarious. finance. Uh, yeah, it was a double major. and Yeah, it really yeah. wasn't. So I bet you used some calculus. I did have it. It was like business calculus, so it was like calculus light, but yeah. But I, I don't. I, I'm not a, interested in vocational universities. I think it's a terrible idea. I think it'll turn our. Wow. There's a whole part of our system idea. that just gets the heart ripped right out of it, if you do that. But then how? Okay, how do we respond then to these people? The occupy whatever. I mean, you can't. You can't blame everything on society. <laughs> Listen, I don't think it has anything. It doesn't have anything or... to do with the fact that they're an I occupy or not. Anything. I think it has no, a that, lot to do with that. No, that strain of society has been saying that for 500 years. It's not. It's there's nothing that's changed there. So the guys who put this on, what what TV station did you see that on? Did you go down and talk to them, or did the? No, no. This is were, a, these are profiles in a magazine. Yeah. They were profiling so somebody, the. Somebody has taken the the very nice neoliberal approach of finding a whole bunch of artsy people who are complaining about business, and then they put it into a magazine. Is that the actual makeup of the people who were there? Because the people that I know who were at different occupies are not like that. The occupy here was full of people with jobs, um, so I think that I don't find it surprising that the news media has taken an angle on it that allows them to sell stuff. Well, but okay, I don't think that... and, and okay, we can separate the occupy Wall Street. We can just look at just pure uh, the, un, the unemployment rate is the highest in the twenty something range than it is in any other age age group in the United States. Mm -hmm. They're coming out of college and can't find jobs. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question I have, is it um, an economic issue or is it a preparation issue? And I think we are too quick to just blame it on the economy. There aren't jobs. I think the biggest part of that has to do with the fact that the 45 to 60 year old group is the largest it's ever been. I think that that's a lot of that's just and they're the not way. leaving they're not yeah. retiring that's that's just the way the numbers have worked out. I don't think there's any big surprise on there and the economy has gone in the tank. And uh, I think that some of the ways that our education system is structured is too vocational and that people end up taking insurance and then going into insurance before they realize that's not going to work out for them. So they end up spending 12 years doing a PhD. Or, or so they, they just don't actually... like J-O-Bs yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and to some degree, I, I don't think vocationalism is going to somehow make our society better. It's certainly not going to make it more creative. Sorry, Jeff. I, I do want to get Gary's comment in here about his daughter, who's graduating with a master's in physics, is uh, has lots of job opportunities. For example, uh, developments in medicine require a great deal of condensed matter physics. Uh, so yay, Big Bang Theory people. Um, and I want to advocate for a hybrid model of secondary <laughs> and the advanced middle education. Road, okay. uh, and you know, I kind of like the whole Khan Academy model of students pursuing their own path, where you have your little learning modules. And I can see a university or a high school saying, all right, you need to take a certain amount of, you know, basic skills, advanced math, some calculus, and, you know, fork over. You need some practical courses and kind of let the students pursue their learning passions with some uh, array of 
required stuff that you want them to have a foundation in different skills and realities uh, and let them pursue their passions and and I, I like the flipped classroom. I, I, you know, I know you guys like to harsh on Khan Academy. Is not, uh, you don't harsh on it, but it, it's not the harsh. complete model. But I, I do think there, there's some virtue there. And here's your learning content. Go engage with it. And now come to our university seminar and discuss how it applies to other things you're learning in real life. I don't have a problem with Khan Academy at all, actually. But no, my, I, my problem is, is if you are taking... Right. All of instruction, take everything that a kid needs to know and break it down into four minute videos and have them watch them in order and then take a test. That's not education. Yeah. I mean, I think education is having them engage in that variety, come together face to face, even no technology. I mean, really, if we if we used tools like Khan Academy or, you know, recorded uh, lectures and I'm thinking about I have a, a biology teacher in my high school who is retiring this year and he can teach you know photosynthesis like nobody I've ever seen like I can't understand it but if I sit in his classroom for 15 minutes I get it right if we recorded that piece and used that to teach photosynthesis and stopped lecturing kids six times a day every year in every class uh, on how to do that or how to uh, understand what's going on with photosynthesis and spent you know, watch this six minute video and then let's move on and and do some deeper things. I think that, that that's where Khan Academy's place is and uh, similar resources like it. Just depends ahead, what Dave. you want. It just depends what you want. I mean, Khan Academy, if, if I'm trying to remember how to do quadratic equations, um, Khan Academy is great because mm -hmm. it'll help me figure that out. And it, it's really well structured to do what it does. And I think it does that very well. Right. If our system is about putting out people who can do quadratic equations. Well, if um, you don't remember when you need to use a quadratic equation, you know, if, if you're at the point where I need a quadratic equation, I don't remember how to do this. That's where Khan Academy is great. If you don't know that you need quadratic equations, you're lost. You're, you're falling back on your, uh, on your conference there again. It's about finding out. <laughs> and, and to me, that's, sure, yeah, that's it. Right. I, I don't care about the content of school, right? I don't care if, if you, come out knowing it and being able to reproduce it on a test because I don't think the things we know are reducible. I don't think we can reduce them to the bare parts and say these are the things we need to know. Because Very much for, for that exact reason, I agree with Jeff, I think it's a really nice formulation of it. Knowing how to decide about what you need to do is by far the harder part. Knowing, having somebody model what a professional is, which is what I think of universities as being the best at um, when the people who are doing the modeling are doing good modeling. Um, but the content of it, I mean, in terms of a day-to-day, -day, get anything done inside of a, any kind of business I've ever been part of, you don't need to remember much. You know, you just have to have broad literacies, not simple skills. I, I suspect we're going to be heading to the home stretch fairly soon. I want to ask a couple things. John, you had mentioned a real-life issue. I wanted to know if that had been addressed. And Dave, was that a man bag that you showed us earlier? He said Purse. he was going to put his laptop in a purse. purse. It does look like a purse. It's yeah. purse. not a very fashionable go. one. <laughs> it's got a white cord. What do you mean it's not fashionable? Yeah, yeah. It's, got it's, 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 it's an got, eye it's got, purse. It's got fresh roasted coffee in it. What else do you want? <laughs> well, it smells good. Get points for that. Great. It sure does. Fresh, fresh roasted coffee and leather all mixed together. Mm. Awesome. It's uh, real life question. We'll have to wait because we don't have it's time long. to talk about it. Well, I mean, the question is this: Now what, right? How do we get? In, <laughs> now what? Do we, yeah, that might yeah, be a. How that how do we big. do this, right? I I'm in a school district where we are considered an excellent school district because we do well on tests and have for the last 12 years. And uh, we have a superintendent who's starting to get it, and my boss who is a the human resources director who gets it and some principals who are coming along, how do we change the school culture to embrace this stuff and, and move forward? You know, we have people talking about things like one-to-one -one programs and professional development and, you know, all these different ideas on where we should be heading and how we should be getting there. But my question is how do we affect change within the system? And that's something that's going to take a whole show at least. So, We'll wait for another day on that. Well, and I'm just going to... You're going to answer okay, right th now. This is a perfect okay. example of our conversation here. I think there's such disagreement on 
what school is supposed the outcome of the right, whole right. activity then what how, is if you can't agree on the outcome to how are you going <laughs> to agree on how it should be uh, absolutely that's the problem it's always so. the problem create it so that you can have variable outcomes middle guy middle create right your guy own says. outcome yeah sure <laughs> right outcome. sounds great until you like try to get accredited <laughs> <laughs> say, oh yeah, our students are going to design their own outcomes, and then we're going to. What? How are you going to assess <laughs> them? You're fired. Right. When I and I get back, go back to the uh, Eric Duvall stuff from from several weeks ago now on the MOOC, where he was saying, give students students have to ha have access to all of the information all of the time, you know. And I hold up my cell phone all the time and say, I have the information, and so does every kid in our school. They have the information. Now what do we do? Because up to now, we've been giving them information. That's right. So what is the point of them being here? And you know, those are some tough questions for school, especially a school that is do doing really well by all of the traditional measures and all of the current measures on how we rate schools. So you know, a lot of them are saying, we don't need to change anything. We're doing great. So, And from a certain perspective, you are. Right. On that happy note. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, Jennifer, what are you doing next weekend? Oh, I'm going to Virginia. I'm going to um, get some Jennifer Laddie da. I'm putting in the chat room if I can get it there. This is my. Um... God, it's hard to get stuff in this. You, you thing, can't. Isn't are it? you guys Doc, not able to Dr. paste either? Uh, I'm having difficulties. It's Java. It's Java. I'm um, so unhappy. Java with doesn't allow Java. pasting. Let's see. I was trying to find my mage. Let me see if I can. Oopsie. So, thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah I'd love it's one. not working. So, um, you're getting what? You're doing what? Oh, I'm getting my... Um, put it in our hangout chat. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah, I'll do that. That's a good idea. And you're can you put getting it in a there? degree from some university in Virginia? Yes, Old Dominion University. Old Dominion. And have, yes. have you ever been there before? Um, <laughs> once. I was I interviewed there and I'm gonna walk across the stage there. And that's awesome. It. That's and you're it. getting a degree in in uh, instructional, instructional design, tech, and design and technology. Yes. And that in that uh, that qualifies you to do what? Not I, I, probably not a lot. <laughs> Shouldn't that program be more vocational? <laughs> and that's the problem. I think it was too much theory. I'm not sure if I know. I'm totally kidding. No, Once no, you get that's, that. Piece of paper, can we call you doctor? Uh, no, no one's ever allowed Dr. to do J. that. Mad. Dr. You know. J. Mad. Dr. J. But take, taking M. Dave's question very seriously, you know, that is the, the question all the time is how much do we teach people how to be a practitioner and how much do we spend time teaching theory and all here's sorts of here's my stuff. Here's my problem. Doing a vocational program is the surest way to prepare yourself for 20 years ago. I don't think we can move forward, be creative, have new business, have all the rest of those things, teaching people the things that somebody 20 years before knows. I just don't think it works. Listen, we need engineers. Sure, we have a program for making engineers and it works. There are engineers coming out all the time. We have, th those things are taken care of. The things that are specific. We have an insurance, your proof, insurance program I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. We have them. I don't think we need any more of them. I think what we need to do is get more creative about the way that we do yeah and that's a whole other show in fact john and i had our little back channel this afternoon then talking about corporate ed what's the role of that which it sounds like we're pushing a lot of the actual vocational training to the workplace which is again a whole i'll show it next next year 2012 so, that's our, our first show how do you learn in the workplace so next week when we come back a whole year i'd love to babble about that yeah say what john are we coming back next week I know you're not. I'm, I won't be here. And then two weeks from now, we're not going to have a show because it's Christmas. Yeah. Christmas break. Unless, Christmas unless, break. Jeff can do a show because it's a, it's Boxing Day. And then three weeks. You could have Chinese food and do a show. Jeff could have Chinese food and do a show, eh, Jeff? He's just smiling oh, and nodding yeah. over there. So we will. This what's our new name? Is it whenever? No. Tech whenever. At tech tech whenever. whenever. We don't have to change be. the acronym. It's beautiful. Awesome. ETW. I like, I like it. I had a thought of possibly doing a New Year's webcast a thon. So I'm not going to say it's happening yet. I'm going to 
think that through before I make you announcements. Just, you just said it's happening. It's yeah. happening. It's been a while. Jeff's having a webcast a thon. Yeah. You guys never showed up for him anyway, but I did. I showed I would up. Lurk. Yep. yep up, You'd lurk, all right? That. I would yeah. frequently lurk. I'll do that. New Year's might be tough. We can do but... that. Well, it would be Jeff's a New Year's gonna... weekend. It's kind of it works out well. You got Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Right. I'll be in a hotel. Doing what? Where? I'm going to the Rose Bowl. <gasps> Rose Bowl. Live report. <laughs> it's true. Live report from the scene. J Matt is streaming the parade. Yeah. And and graduation. Everyone loves the parade. Right. You oh, and I should, Tom. I I'd love to see that. You and Tom's coverage of. Yeah, that's a nice flow. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 You'd be like, flowers. stop it. Turn that up. camera off. No we don't want to watch HGTV talking about the roses. We want to see J Matt. <laughs> Stocking my nephew. Rap, rap, rap. Thanks, rap, guys. Rap, Bye. Rap. End of show. That's for now. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, yeah, see you next Look, year. Look, that means no... Man, I can see... Wow. Do you remember when we used to do post shows? Go on. No, I don't... You were Go the only on. one that liked post show. I never liked... <laughs> <laughs> There's too much touchy Holy feeling cow. asking people about their opinions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We're going to be back next week, though, right? Except John. Maybe. Uh, okay. Some of us. I, John, I'm, I'm excited. Unless it snows. Even if it snows, I haven't had this much enthusiasm from John in months, so sure. <laughs> yeah, John, when was the last time you were on on a Sunday night? Uh, it's been a while. As long as you might be willing to do a show, it's gosh. Been a while, a month maybe. I don't know. All right. Well, we'll we'll tentatively say we're going to do a show next week, and then we'll cancel it at the last minute. And I might be home in time. I think uh, my flight gets in at like. My my goal is actually <coughs> to Excuse decide me. on this stuff before Jeff goes to bed, <laughs> so he doesn't have to get up early. <laughs> Yeah, that's not very nice to make him it get up. It is not yeah. very nice. Yeah. And actually, the first few Mondays in January, I may my schedule might change, and I might not be available oh. anymore. No. Yeah. Well, who's who's going to do the technical stuff? Oh no! It's a new year, a new it. opportunity to learn 21st century skills. No. From what Dave said, you don't need to know them. All right, then he's in charge of streaming. <laughs> Vocational skills are not necessary. I would Gary, thank you so in. much for listening to us ramble. Oh, thanks for being 100% area. of the audience. That's awesome. All right. All right. Okay, ta ta for now. Have a good week. Bye. Thanks, Bye. John, for trying to get me to talk about next week. Bye. <laughs> Congratulations. Hire this woman. Jen. If we Hire her. Hire her. No. Ta ta. Give her a job where she doesn't have to do anything. Right on. All Bye, right. Jeff. Talk to you. Bye.